Good evening. It's good to be back with you again as we continue on our study through the intertestamental period. Uh, tonight, we're going to basically conclude um, the time frame that is given in the intertestamental period. Uh, next week, uh, Lord willing, if Brittany doesn't go into labor before then, um, we'll finish up with Lesson 13, talking about the religious climate and situation there in first century Judea when Jesus began to preach and to teach and start his earthly ministry, which I think will be an interesting class for us to go through. But going through the timeline, we've basically gone through roughly about 600 years talking about the fall of Jerusalem in 586, the Babylonians, the Persian Empire that ensued, then of course in the mid-400s with Ezra and Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, and then talking about the transition between Persian rule to the Greeks coming in in about 323 B.C. with Alexander the Great, then of course his reign being a comet burning in the, the sky, if you will, bright, vibrant, but he dies at a young age and his kingdom is split between his four generals or four of his generals. He had more than four, but the kingdom is split between four of his generals. And Ptolemy rules Judea from Egypt and then, a, then Antiochus the Great takes over in 190 BC and for the Seleucid Empire. And we spent a lot of time talking about the the, uh, the Hasmoneans and them trying to gain independence. And ultimately, they do gain independence through the Maccabean Wars and the revolts. And then we kind of see the Maccabeans and the Hasmoneans over time getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And last week, we talked about the emergence of Herod, Herod the Great. We talked about how Antipas, who was from Idumea, he was raised a pagan, was a nobleman in the land of Idumea, but it was taken over by uh, John Hyrcanus I, and Antipas becomes a pretty leading figure than his son, who also is called Antipas or Antipater, which can be kind of confusing. But he becomes basically the ruler of the region under Julius Caesar and then under Augustus. And then, of course, you have Herod the Great comes to power. And as we talked about last week, and as we get to our recap, we can see here that the kingdom of Herod the Great expanded. And so through his influence and through his Friendship with Caesar Augustus or Octavian, whichever name you want to call him by. He went by Octavian in his early life, but we know him best by Caesar Augustus. And so he was able to expand the borders of the kingdom, uh, the likes of which have probably never been seen. We've seen this amount of land size being controlled by the Hasmoneans. But when you're talking about absolute power for the length of time that he was able to rule the ability that he was able to rule without insurrection or people kind of rebelling against him because of his power. I dare say that there was no one who had a stronger rule than probably Solomon. If you're going to talk about the entire history of God's people, nobody was able to rule and have as much power, much money, as much influence, probably as Solomon. Now, somebody could argue with that and say, well, you know, technically, if you're talking about like John Hyrcanus and Aristobulus, like, you know, Herod the Great, he had to play to Rome. I mean, he was the king, but I mean, he had an answer to Augustus. That's true. You could argue that John Hyrcanus or Aristobulus didn't really have to do that. But at the same time, they also dealt with rebellions and revolts and didn't have as much money or as much power. I mean, basically, as long as Herod played lip service to Augustus and sent the yearly tributes, for if you lived in Judea, Herod's the king. You know, what he says goes. He's the, he's the boss, right? And so... A pretty powerful guy. So Herod the Great brought political stability through tyrannical fear. And what this did, this area had been having civil wars and people have been arguing over who was the rightful high priest and who was the rightful king for the last 100 years. And there's been all kinds of political divisions. And, and this group hates that group. And this group thinks this guy should be king. When Herod steps up to the plate and he has absolute control for 40 years and anybody who speaks out against him has disappeared in the middle of the night, People quit having political debates. They start having religious debates, right? Because Herod just really doesn't care about religious debates. Whether you're a Sadducee or an Essene or a Pharisee, he doesn't care. And so people find an appeal to being able to debate, right? To argue, to have different opinions. And religion has typically been one of those things that people like to have different opinions and debates about. And so you see this emergence of this idea of becoming Messiah. And so the temple complex also during this time becomes the pride of the Jewish people. It becomes the largest and wealthiest temple complex in the ancient world, bar none. And so uh, you have this time where the temple is now, 
that has more gold and silver than any other temple in the world. It's larger than any other temple in the world. And now the Jews are also more focused on religion than they have been in a long, long time, right? So you can see why this would be considered the fullness of time. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But there's also underneath the surface a feeling of anti-Herodian, anti-Roman sentiment that is growing in the underground, if you will, and also growing in religious circles. Because now it looks like the only way we're going to have a king who's going to rule according to God's intent is if that king is divinely appointed, a.k.a. the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And so you see through the rule of Herod, and the growth of religious fervor, this idea of, of, of longing for the Messiah to come. And so uh, that's kind of our recap whenever we're talking about Herod. And so Herod dies, and at Herod's death, he has a will. But Herod's not the boss, like we said. He is, for all intents and purposes, but his good friend, Caesar Augustus. And you may say, Isaac, how are they good friends? Herod was, was raised in Rome, Right. I mean, when, when Antipas had Herod, he sent Herod to Rome to be raised and taught by the wealthiest, best teachers and military leaders in Rome. Guess who also got that treatment? Augustus. Are you still friends with the guys you went to school with or the girls you went to school with? Probably so, right? Facebook's made it easier, right? But even more so in the ancient world when we're talking about aristocracy. So Herod and Augustus were friends. So the interesting thing is that Herod, who's already killed three sons and a few wives by this point for suspicion for trying to to overthrow his, his throne, before he dies, he has Antipas as the inheritor of, the, of his throne, right? So he's going to use three sons who are going to take his kingdom, and he's got Antipas. He's already told Antipas, look, you're going to, I'm going to divide my kingdom between my three sons. Three of my sons I've got left. He had more than just three but three of my sons that I've got living, and you're going to get most of the empire. There's a problem. Three weeks before Herod dies, he changes his will. So now instead of Antipas going to be the guy that gets most of the empire, it's going to be Herod Archelaus. How do you think Herod Antipas is going to feel about that? I mean, how would you feel about that? I mean, you know, you're going to get most of daddy's land and money. Then three weeks before he dies, he gives it to your half brother that you don't even like. Right? Probably not very, probably not very happy. So there is going to be some contention over the will. So basically, Augustus has to decide what's going to happen. And so after the death of Herod, the will is read, and the will is that the kingdom is going to be split between four people. And then you have the Herodian Tetrarchy, and Tetrarchy just comes from two Greek words: tetra, which means four, and archos, which means ruler. Four rulers, basically, is what Tetrarchy means. And so between his three sons, his three sons of Archelaus, Antipas, and Philip, and a sister, Salome the first. And there's an argument as to who's going to be the one who's going to have it over. And so while they are trying to figure it out, the people in, in Jerusalem start a riot in the temple. And so Archelaus, who is supposed to inherit Judea, which is where Jerusalem is, Augustus has not given him the official title of king yet. Augustus has not officially given him the right to govern in Jerusalem. But there's a problem. There's a riot. And there's nobody there to put down the riot except for him. So does he move against the rioters? He's not technically been given the official credence. So he sends in some, some guys to the Temple Mount for them, like, like, a, like a, a cohort of guys like 50 guys, to go over to the Temple Mount and tell these guys to quit rioting. All right, the, the, the priest and the people who are there stone like 35 of the 50 guys who come in there, right? So now what's Archelaus supposed to do? They just killed 35 guys in the temple, like in the, on the Temple Mount, right? And so he sends in his army, and he winds up killing 3,000 people on the Temple Mount while they're making sacrifices to Yahweh. Right for a for a new divine ruler or king, bad stuff. And so Antipas and Archelaus and Philip have to go to Rome. So you got the three brothers, right, that don't like each other, who've never liked each other. They've all got different moms. They go to Rome, and Antipas is saying, "I'm supposed to be the rightful heir." 
Archelaus is saying, in daddy's last will, he left it to me. And then Antipas is saying, well, you know, Augustus, if you look, Archelaus just killed 3,000 people in the temple. I mean, does that sound like somebody who's trying to not usurp your authority? He wants to be king. He's already acting like king, right? So there's this big whatever, and Augustus finally just reads the will and says, look, the way Herod left it, it's the way we're going to split it, all right? So that's, that's the way it's going to happen. And so here we have the Herodian Tetrarchy. And so if you can see there on that map, you will see that Archelaus is in blue. He's going to get Samaria, Judea, and Idumea. He's going to get um, the largest territory and the wealthiest territory. Antipas is going to get the purple territory. That's going to be Galilee and Perea. Now, if you notice, there are two the two portions in purple. Are those two connected? No. In fact, it looks kind of odd that he would rule those two places. Well, the one that is on the other side of the Jordan River, he gets because on the other side of that is the Nabataean kingdom. And he's actually married to the Nabataean king's daughter. It's going to be very important a little bit later in our study, so just remember that. And then you have Philip, who's going to have the brown area, which is the least, uh, the smallest and the least wealthy. You're going to see the pink areas. That is Salome the first. And the red areas are the areas controlled by the Syrian provincial governor of Rome. That's Roman land. It's Roman territory. It's all under Rome, but that's directly under a Roman official. And so let's talk about Herod Archelaus. And so we've zoomed in on the map, and we can kind of see his area right here. And so he gets 50% of all the kingdom. If you take all the land that Herod had to have or had under his control, Archelaus is going to get 50% of the land. Not only is he going to get 50% of the land, he's going to get the wealthiest land of the territory. And so Samaria, Judea, and the Herodian homeland of Idumea. As I mentioned before, he massacres 3,000 people in the temple during a revolt before he actually gets to power, and so that puts his reign in jeopardy. He's disliked by the Judean population. During the time that he reigns, there are continuous revolts. There are continuous envoys to Rome, to Augustus, that talk bad about Herod Antipas, I mean, Herod Archelaus. Were they being truthful, or do they just hate the guy so much that they just kept pestering Augustus that he was a terrible ruler? I don't know. Maybe a little bit of both. And so eventually in 6 AD, after only ruling for 10 years, Augustus just deposes him anyways. And so he just removes him, puts him in exile in southern Gaul, which is modern-day France, where he's going to live, and then he's eventually going to die in 18 AD. But when he removes him from office, he doesn't put in somebody else. He just says, look, this is going to be a Roman province now. Like Samaria... Judea and Idumea, I'm just going to send a Roman prefect there and there will be no Jewish leader at all. Like you just, there won't be anybody. There will be no puppet, right? It'll just be a Roman prefect from Italy who's going to answer what I say. And anybody who disagrees with me, we'll just crucify and take care of it that way. And so, you know, the, the Jews in Judea, they complain over the fact that they don't like this guy. They want somebody else. And Augustus says, I'll give you. I'll give you what you want, but I'm not going to give you what you want. <laughs> I'm going to take away the guy you don't like, and I'm not going to give you the guy you want. How about that? And so uh, Augustus does it that way. And so no Her Herodian ruler or any Jewish rule anymore in Judea. It's under direct Roman control. But this does set the stage for Roman rule and also for Jesus' crucifixion at the hands of the Gentiles and more specifically, the Romans. And so it is quite interesting to see the providence of God and how these pro these prophecies, uh, especially of Jesus' uh, resurrection, the resurrection of his crucifixion by hanging on a tree, probably would not have come to pass had there not been Roman rule. Had it just been Jewish rule and they wanted to kill Jesus, it probably looked a lot like Acts 7, where they dragged Stephen outside and stoned him. They couldn't do that with the Roman, um, Roman provincial governors, and so Jesus winds up being crucified fulfilling Jesus' prophecy, like in uh, John chapter 3, when he talks about the Son of Man being lifted up, and the Old Testament text of him being hanged on a tree. Now, Herod Archelaus is mentioned in the Bible. And so there are a few Bible references. In Matthew chapter 2, when Joseph is warned about Herod going to kill all the infants in and around Bethlehem, he flees, and he goes to what country? Egypt, right? And then in Matthew chapter 2, Joseph is told to come back 
to um, Judea, come back to Israel, right? But in Matthew chapter 2, verses 19 through 23, it says that Joseph heard that Archelaus had been named king instead of his father, or in place of his father, and he grew greatly afraid. Now, why would Joseph be afraid? And what did he have to go off of? He just killed 3,000 people in the epicenter, the most holy site in the world, right? I mean, you shouldn't kill people. You probably shouldn't kill them on the Temple Mount, right? You know, their blood was literally being intermingled and flowing with the blood of the sacrifices they were making, right? So there's probably a reason why Joseph is afraid to go back to Judea where this guy just was named as king. And so what does the angel tell Joseph to do? Go to Galilee, which is where who's ruling? Antipas, right? And so you can see, and it says to fulfill the prophecy that out of Galilee or Nazareth I called my son, right? And so you can see here in a really weird way, why is Joseph afraid to go to Judea? Because Archelaus just killed 3,000 people on the Temple Mount, right? Which causes him to go to Galilee, which fulfills the prophecy that out of that he would be called a Nazarene, right? And so... All these incidents just seem like random weird things in history. But they all align to fulfill the prophecies that were made hundreds of years previously in the Old Testament, right? See, when we first talked about 3,000 people killing kill Temple Mount, it's like, that's just a weird random historical fact. But it's a weird historical fact that leads to Jesus being raised in Nazareth to fulfill an Old Testament prophecy. Does that make sense? So you, you see God's providential hand being at work even when Archelaus kills 3,000 people on the Temple Mount. Another possible illusion is in Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, it seems that Jesus gives an illusion to Archelaus. In the beginning and conclusion of Jesus' parable of the Menas in the Gospel of Luke, it seems he refers to Archelaus' journey to Rome. Some interpreters conclude that Jesus used familiar lessons to help in his teaching of people. In that passage, it says, A noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Now for us today, we read that and we're thinking, why would a noble man go to a foreign kingdom or to a foreign land to inherit a kingdom? That doesn't make any sense, right? If you want a kingdom, why do you go to a different country? Well, why would it make sense in Jesus' time? Who names the kings? The Romans in a foreign country. Who had to go to a foreign land to get his kingdom? Archelaus. If you continue reading in verse 14, it says, But the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. What does that sound like? Sounds a lot like the Jews sending delegation after delegation to the Romans for Archelaus not to be king. Then verse 27, Before his enemies of mine, he said, the noble man, who do not want me to reign over them, bring them to me and slaughter them before me. Who slaughtered the ones that didn't want him to be king over them? Archelaus, right? And so it definitely seems to me, at least, that Jesus is using the story of Archelaus in Luke 19 uh, to drive a point home to, uh, to the ones who are hearing him teach. So just kind of interesting. If you read, if you look at the life of Archelaus and how it transpired, I don't know how you can't think of him in Luke 19. If you don't know the intestinal period or the history, you may have read Luke 19 tons of times and never even thought about Archelaus. So it's kind of interesting. Then we get to Herod Antipas. And so just know that um, Herod Archelaus reigns until 6 AD, and after that we see the, the Romans take over and they rule directly with the Roman provincial governor. That's why Pilate is there in uh, the crucifixion accounts. That's why Pilate is there. So let's talk about Herod Antipas. The next two are going to have a lot longer rules throughout the entire ministry of Jesus and the establishment of the early church. Herod Antipas is his rule is going to be in the two purple regions, right? And so he ruled Galilee and Perea until his death in 39 CE when he was, or, or, or AD when he was deposed and exiled. This would have been the ruler that Jesus would have grown up under throughout his entirety in Nazareth. And so when Jesus gets to Nazareth, when he is, probably close to the age of 7 to 10, to the time he starts his earthly ministry, roughly a period of 20 years. He's going to spend that 20 years under the reign 
of Herod Antipas. He was a builder like his father, and he built a beautiful city on the Sea of Galilee called Tiberias. Once again, where did Herod Antipas receive his training and education? Rome. And Antipas becomes good friends with a guy that in Rome nobody likes. Right? I mean, he's related to Augustus, but nobody likes him. Everybody thinks he's dumb and just not a very impressive guy. But Antipas likes him. They become friends. Just so happens that after Augustus dies, that Claudius becomes emperor. I'm sorry, Tiberius, right? Claudius is later. But Tiberius becomes emperor, right? And so it works out pretty good for Antipas because one of his really good buddies just became the emperor of Rome, right? And so he has a really good relationship, builds a city there, makes it his capital city and calls it after his buddy, the Caesar of Rome, Tiberius. Tiberius is mentioned a few times in the New Testament, especially like in John chapter 6 in connection with the feeding of the 5,000. And so he's close personal friends with Tiberius, and he married um, Herodias, uh, the wife of his brother Philip. Uh, he went on a trip to Rome with his brother Philip, and he uh, got attached to his sister-in-law, and they actually wound up getting married. And so um, before we get there, um, the city that he built in Tiberias it was, had 17 hot natural springs, and it was a kind of a, a destination in that region of the ancient world. Um, Antipas ruled here. Possibly this is where John the baptizer would have been in prison and beheaded, although Josephus says it took place at the fort of uh, Macarius. And so um, let's see here. He's most widely known for this action in the Bible, like in Matthew 14, uh, the, the account of him being married to Herod, uh, Herodias, his brother's wife. Um, this is important for the dating of Jesus' ministry uh, because um, Josephus puts the marriage around 27 AD. We know this takes place roughly at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, um, which kind of coincides with the date that Jesus was born during the reign of, of Herod the Great, which would be at least before 4 BC, right? And so uh, Jesus was born before he was born, right? So, you know... Um, well, we, we may talk about the development of the uh, the Western uh, calendar and why it is off by a few years. Um, but it's important for dating um, Jesus' ministry. John the baptizer speaks out against the unlawful marriage. It's unlawful um, because uh, he's not supposed to marry his brother's wife while uh, he is alive. And so John the baptizer is beheaded and imprisoned. But that's not the only issue that Herod Antipas has with this great sin of taking his brother's wife because he is married to the daughter of Aretas, who is the king of the Nabataeans, which is the largest and strongest and closest um, neighbor that they have. And so the Nabataeans aren't ruled by Rome and they're not ruled by the Parthians. They're kind of their own kingdom at this point. And Aretas is pretty stout. He rules for 50 years, from 9 B.C. all the way to 40 A.D. They're a nomadic tribe. Their capital city is in Petra or Petra. And so, you know, it's not a guy you want to make mad, right? I mean, you just can't divorce his daughter, right? I mean, as you know, that's, you can't just do that. And so it's going to start a war. And um, Aretas is actually going to attack Herod Antipas and crush his armies. Now, who is Antipas's good friend? Tiberius. So Tiberius says, you know what? I wouldn't mind taking over the Nabataean kingdom. I mean, they have access to the trade routes through the Sinai Peninsula, so that could be beneficial to me. So Tiberius actually gets a Roman army ready to go and to fight for Herod Antipas. But Tiberius is going to die, and Caligula is going to take over in his place. Caligula doesn't like Tiberius, and he doesn't like anybody who was close to Tiberius, which includes Herod Antipas. And the nephew of Antipas is named Herod Agrippa I. Guess where he was raised? Rome. And guess who he was friends with? Caligula, right? And so it just goes to show you, it's not what you know in this life. What is it? Hadn't changed, has it? Not much. So he was raised in Rome with the next generation. Next generation, 
Caligula. And so he says, look, you know, uh, my uncle, you know, he's a terrible guy and he's dumb. And he picked a war with the Nabataeans for divorcing his wife, the king of the uh, Nabataeans. And it would be cool if I was ruler in his place. So Caligula actually deposes Herod Antipas, who's been the ruler there in Galilee for 43 years. I mean, the guy's ruled over four decades. And so he's exiled to Spain where he eventually dies. And Herod Agrippa I uh, becomes king of that region, which is kind of interesting because um, Herod Agrippa is going to be an individual that is also known uh, to us in the New Testament. Um, in Acts chapter 12, he is the King Herod who kills the Apostle James and puts Peter into prison. And so uh, also Acts chapter 12 gives us uh, the details of his death. His son, King Agrippa II, is going to be the Agrippa that Paul addresses in Acts 25. And so you can see this Herod Agrippa and his son, Herod Agrippa II, play a pretty big role in the New Testament and the early church. And so one of the things about Herod Antipas, from a religious standpoint, he seems kind of bipolar. He rules like a Gentile, but he also has deep sympathies to Judaism. He liked John the baptizer. Uh, the Bible tells us that he, would, he enjoyed listening to John. And while he would listen to John, he would have fear. And so he recognized that John was a prophet of God, even though he winds up beheading him. Um, he wanted to hear and meet Jesus. When he does meet Jesus, he's uh, unimpressed because Jesus won't do a sign or a miracle. So he sends Jesus back to Pilate, uh, mocking him, right? Uh, and Pilate thinks it's funny. And the Bible tells us they strike up our friendship. He's mentioned the Bible several times, of course, the beheading of John, the plot against Jesus. In Luke 13, 31, the Pharisees come and tell Jesus that that he's trying to kill him, that, that Antipas is trying to kill Jesus. Now, was he really or was that just the Pharisees trying to get Jesus on the bad side to say something bad about Antipas, right? I mean, the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus. If we can get him to say something bad about Antipas, maybe we can go to Antipas and say that Jesus is talking bad about you, just like John was. And what did Antipas do to John? Beheaded him, right? So Antipas already has a track record of not being afraid to kill prophets, right? And so maybe they can get Jesus to say something bad about Antipas. Jesus doesn't take it right. And what does he refer to him as in Luke 13? A fox, right? But one of the things that is interesting is where was Jesus' home base during his ministry? Capernaum. Capernaum is not under the reign of Antipas, it's under the reign of Philip. And the Bible tells us that Jesus goes there after John the Baptizer is beheaded. And so after Antipas takes John and beheads him, Jesus actually moves from the region where he's been for the entirety of his life from age. Eight ish to age 30 ish, and actually moves to a different region to a much more lenient and benevolent king. Now, Jesus still preaches and teaches in the land that is under the rule of Antipas, but as far as his home base, it's actually in a different region. So, something that's kind of interesting to see there, right? And so, in this, you see the kingdom of Aretas IV, the king of the Nabataeans. And so you can see this is a pretty sizable area. Now, it's also a pretty dry, arid area too. So it's not probably as populated, but it is a pretty good swath of land. It was a pretty wealthy kingdom because they controlled the trade routes between like Babylon and Susa and Egypt. So very, very rich trading. And you guys have probably seen pictures of Petra, considered to be one of the wonders of the ancient world. Uh, these uh, buildings and castles that are carved in these uh, the sandstone there. And so uh, King Eretus is mentioned in the Bible several times. Um, ancient nomadic kingdom lasted for a thousand years. Uh, largest, closest kingdom to Judea played a major role politically. Eretus's daughter was married to Antipas, and it started a war. And he's actually mentioned by the Apostle Paul. Paul says that after his conversion in Damascus, he started to preach and teach. Acts chapter 9 says that the Jews had a plot against him where he had to be laid down from what? The city wall in a, in a basket, right? When Paul talks about it, he says it was, wasn't actually the Jews themselves, but it's actually he was trying to escape from the government, right? From the governor under King Eretus. Well, we know Eretus died in 40, 
we know the Nabataeans didn't actually take control of Damascus until at least 37. So we can actually take this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and pretty much pinpoint the year or the range of years that the Apostle Paul was converted. Had to be between 37 and 40 AD. Because Aridus didn't control the area until 37. He died in 40, right? And so by taking history, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we can actually pinpoint as to when the Apostle Paul was baptized. It also shows us there's at least 10 years between Acts 2 and Acts 9, right? Because if Jesus was born in 6, which puts his death now closer to 27 and not 33, or like we uh, historically have said, just because we always start at zero, we probably should start closer to 6, right? So the church is established probably closer to 27 A.D. The Apostle Paul is not uh, converted to at least 37. So sometimes you, we don't, if we're just reading the book of Acts, we, we don't think about the idea that Acts chapter 9 is 10 years after the church is established at least. And then you read Acts chapter 12 with the death of James. That happens in 44. So you've almost got 17 years between Acts 1 and Acts 12. right? And so those things help you understand the text of the Bible and understand the chronology of what's taking place, right? And so uh, so those things are important things for us to, to know. Any questions or comments so far on uh, Herod Archelaus or Herod Antipas? No? All right, great. And so um, then we have Philip, right? And so Philip's territory is in the brown. Uh, I couldn't find a good one that just had the brown uh, imagery, but but Philip's territory is going to be in the brown. There's some really important cities in his territory, like Bethsaida, Capernaum, and Caesarea Philippi. We'll talk about those in just a second. But Philip rules for a pretty long time, too. He rules from 4 B.C. to 34 A.D., so about 38 years. Excuse me. This is the smallest and the poorest territory. And it's interesting because he's probably the best ruler of all three of us of all three of them. Now, is that because it's the smallest and poorest territory? So there's not as much stuff going on. There's not as many crises. There's not a lot of people revolting. Maybe that's why he's such a good. I don't know. But if I had to pick a region to live in, I think Jesus is smarter than I am, and Jesus lived in Philip's territory. So I think that should say something to us. But anyways, and a really weird story. He marries his niece, Salome. Now listen, what was the, the name of Herod's sister? Salome. Not the same one. One of the most confusing things about this time period is everybody uses the same names. right? Whether you're looking at Roman history or Jewish history, Egyptian, everybody uses the same name. Everybody in Egypt is named Ptolemy or Cleopatra. Everybody in Rome is named Marcus, Gaius, Julius, like there's like eight names they just keep reusing, right? You know, and it gets so confusing. There's at least, I mean, Herod the Great has at least two sons named Philip. I mean, for the I mean, who names their son the same name for multiple sons? Nobody, unless you live in the ancient world and you only got eight to pick from. You know, it's like it's just crazy. So this is not. This is not Salome, his grandmother. This is not Salome, his aunt. This is not Salome, his half-sister. This is Salome, his niece, right? Did y'all catch that? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's incredible. Sometimes you got to have a map, like, like a genealogy tree, to figure out which one you're talking about. And so um, he marries his niece, Salome. And uh, this is the daughter who danced uh, this is the daughter of Herodias who danced for Antipas. You remember that story in Matthew chapter 14? The daughter of Herodias comes and dances and pleases Herod and his friends at the banquet. And he says, I'll give you, I'll give you anything you want up to half of my kingdom, right? This is Salome. We know when she was born, 14 CE. So she's probably somewhere between 12 and 14 years old. Whenever she dances and Herod is says, you can have up to half of my kingdom, right? A few years, and her mother tells her to ask for the head of John the Baptist on the plate, right? I mean, you could see a 12-year-old girl, right? I mean, she comes in. She does the Macarena. Everybody claps. You know, the king says, hey, what do you want, honey? 
<laughs> you know, and she asked mom at 12, what should I ask for mom? Ask for the head of a man on a, on a silver platter, honey. Make mommy happy. Mercy. You know, you thought your family was weird. And so she marries her uncle, who's 39 years older than she is. You thought your family was weird. And so some people say that this was actually his half-sister. Now, you know, incestuous marriages are pretty common in the Herodian dynasty. I mean, it's I mean, marrying aunts and nieces and people being their cousin were also being their granddaughter is super common, right? During this time frame. For us, it's weird. Ancient world, it's not. And so some would say it's his half-sister. I don't think that's right. I think it's Herodias' daughter. That seems to be the consensus in uh, the ancient accounts, like Josephus and others. And so, like I said, she, they get married 39 years earlier. He, this territory is mostly Gentiles are super Hellenized Jews. He has no political ambition, right? The two older brothers, Archelaus and Antipas, they both think their daddy's rightful heir. Philip knows that daddy never liked him anyways, right? He's just happy to have some land, some rule, pretty nice palace in Caesarea Philippi that he names and, and names he builds and names after himself. He's pretty content, right? He doesn't care about prophets. He doesn't care about religious squabbles. He just don't care, right? So super chill place. The people love him, right? He's the benevolent king um, that you would kind of want. He built Caesarea Philippi, pretty important uh, place. Matthew 16, Jesus going towards Caesarea Philippi. And he says, who do men say that I am? Right, And that's where Peter makes that great confession, right? You're the Christ, Son of the living God, on the way to Caesarea Philippi. Also, uh, Bethsaida was in his territory. Bethsaida is important because it's the hometown of the big four. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. That inner circle, those fishermen, they're actually from Philip's area, which is kind of nice because guess what? They're from the area that is the most stable politically and religiously. Right? There's something, to, I think, to be learned from that. Um, Capernaum, Jesus' residence where he moves after John is beheaded. Right? He moves away from Galilee, where uh, Antipas is, over into um, Philip's territory after John the Baptist is beheaded. Uh, eventually, uh, Antipas is deposed by Caligula, and the territories are given to Agrippa the first. Um, I'm sorry, Philip die, dies childless in 34 AD. And so those territories that you see before, the brown territories and the purple territories, Caligula is actually going to combine those territories and give them to Herod Agrippa um, after he dies, dies childless. And so, yeah. Yeah. The Agrippa I kills James in Acts 12. Agrippa II is one of the addressed Paul in Acts 25. Um, yeah. One cool thing, uh, Herod Agrippa I, his, he would have a son, King Agrippa II, which is mentioned in Acts 25. He had a daughter who was named Drusilla, and Drusilla and her son Marcus Antonius Agrippa would both die at Pompeii during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. And so Pliny the Younger actually writes about um, Queen Drusilla and her son uh, dying in Pompeii. Um, or was it or was it Cassius Dio? Because Pliny may have died at Pompeii. Too. Somebody, a, a Roman historian, right? Let's, let's call him Cassius Dio. It's probably, uh, probably not right, but it's whatever. Um, writes and says about her dying uh, at Pompeii. Any questions on this guy? I was like, no, Isaac, just finish. <laughs> and so, all right. So the last of the big four, right? And Salome the first, the sister of Herod, and she's virtually insignificant. I mean, she rules um, from 4 BC to 10 AD. And for the New Testament or our purposes, not important whatsoever. Um, she dies in 10 and Augustus takes over her lands on the coast and gives them to his sister. And eventually they just become part of the Roman province of Judea. I mean, like we said before, in 6 AD, the Romans take over the province of Samaria, Judea, Idumea. If you look back at hers, she's bordering Idumea and Judea. And so they just take that land too and attach it to um, 
the Roman province of Judea anyways. But she is important because Herodias, the woman who asked for John the Baptizer's head on the plate, this is her great-granddaughter. It's also her great-niece. Right, so it's just one of those things through marriage. She can claim them both ways. You know, it's like I got I got a double cousin. Anybody got a double cousin here? Nobody? Oh, don't lie to me like that. Don't be embarrassed. Right? I got a double cousin, right? Anybody know what a double cousin is? It means you're kin on both sides. It's true. Me and Ryan Morris, right? Uh, his mother is my dad's second cousin. His dad is my mother's brother. That makes sense? So I could claim him as my first cousin on my mama's side, or I claim him as my third cousin on my daddy's side. It's a double cousin. Y'all are laughing, but I'm pretty sure some of y'all got double cousins too. If not, you should. It makes Christmas easier. All right. So, so what is the conclusion as we come to a close? We've talked about a lot of names and a lot of dates, and, and it's confusing, I know. Uh, but I do think this class is important, as all the classes have been, because this is the political drop back of the life of Jesus and the early church. I mean, the guys we've been talking about, one kills John the Baptist. You know, Jesus flees one to go to the territory of another. You know, one actually has Jesus on trial. Pilate sends Jesus to Herod Antipas where then Herod Antipas beats Jesus, mocks him, and then sends him back to Pilate. Um, you know, Philip and uh, Antipas's land is combined by Caligula and then given to Herod Agrippa I, who kills one of the apostles. The first apostle to be martyred is James in Acts 12. We know his name, right? We know his history. His son, King Agrippa II, is who Paul makes an appeal to in Acts 25. And so knowing those things, I think, helps us have a better understanding of the New Testament. Uh, also, there's many biblical references to these rulers and or the places they built and ruled. Why did Jesus go to Capernaum? Well, if you don't know the political drop back, you could guess as to why. But if you know what's going on with Herod Antipas, you know why Jesus goes to Capernaum. And so and I also think it's very interesting to me when. You see these events in history take place and how the prophecies are fulfill, fulfilled by their rules and actions or by these rulers and their actions, right? You know, when we're talking about the Maccabean revolt in 164 and the cleansing of the temple and these things just seem like random historical acts. But then you go back and read Daniel chapter 11 and 12 and, and God prophesied those things 300 years earlier, right? Or you go back and you read the specific prophecies of Jesus' life and how he would die and those things being shaped by the actions of individuals 30 years before the crucifixion as to who's going to be the ruler, right? And to me, it just go, it just shows that God has a hand in everything, right? I mean, who's in control? God. And I'm sure nobody at the time knew that those 3,000 people being slaughtered on the Temple Mount was going to make a, any difference in the Messiah. But it actually did. And we read Matthew chapter 2, and we can see it. Does God tell us that He's still at work in our lives today? He does, right? You read the, you read the, uh, the New Testament epistles. You read um, uh, the book of Revelation and talking about the things that transpired there. And so, uh, is God still at work in the lives of men today for His providence? Yeah. You know, and we see political rulers today. We see things being done, and I don't have a clue what the Lord's doing. But I know, I know He's doing something, right? It impacts me in a specific way. So I think being able to see historically how these things affect the New Testament world and see God's actions and His workings, I think it's really cool and it helps remind us that we like to think, maybe you don't, okay? Sometimes we think that we're so far removed from the life of Jesus, at least I do, that we have a temptation or a danger to be, to be agnostic Christians. Agnostics believe that maybe there is a God, but He just spun the world and things just happen for no rhyme or no reason. And if there is a God, He's not really watching. He doesn't really care, right? 
And sometimes if I'm not careful, I can be an agnostic Christian. And I can think that Jesus died 2,000 years ago and he gave us the New Testament and he basically just spun everything and said, here's my word, figured out, I'll be back one day. I don't think that's the proper way. I don't think we should be agnostic Christians, right? I think we should believe in the providence and the power of God and is working in our everyday lives. So uh, this class helps me with that. And I've talked long enough on purpose where you can't ask any questions about that. <laughs> um, but I'm looking forward to our class next week, uh, Lord willing. Uh, we're going to be talking about the religious climate of the first century. We'll talk a lot about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and those things and how Jesus' teachings uh, reflect the uh, the religious um, uh, climate of the first century. And so thank you guys so much for a good class. And uh, let's go ahead, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and for all of our blessings. So thankful for the congregation here at Chapel Hill and for our brothers and sisters in Christ who make up this body. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity that we get to have to come together through the middle of our week and the stresses and responsibilities we have at life and let those things go for a little while and to study your word, to study history and how you work through history uh, to make this the fullness of time for Christ to come. And dear Heavenly Father, please help us to also learn from this study to also see that you're also at work today in our lives, in the lives of men and power and, and, and influence today. And dear Heavenly Father, please help us to be faithful and to be watchful for the coming Messiah. Just like those individuals in the first century who were able to read your word and understand that that was the fullness of time, who were ready when Christ came, who listened to his words and obeyed him while he was walking on this earth. And dear Heavenly Father, give us the wisdom to to read your word and to be ready for the coming Messiah and to be ready uh, to, to, to live for him in this life and to live with him in the next life. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.